Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third session of our annual conference for 2022, Building an Intergenerational Nation. Uh, my name is Graham Hewitson. I'm the current chair of Generations Working Together. And what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is guide you through the afternoon uh, and share some information with you. The vision that we work towards in Generations Working Together is to live in a Scotland where different generations are more connected and everyone has the opportunity to build relationships that help to create a fairer society. To help us to progress towards that vision, we've published a manifesto in 2021 in which we urge Scotland to become an intergenerational nation by 2030. And we also have a corporate plan which sets out a range of actions that we intend to take to help us move towards that goal, including our work on influencing policy, on increasing participation in intergenerational projects and activities, and on stimulating and supporting research and innovation. As an organisation, we see ourselves as a leader in the field of intergenerational work in Scotland, offering direction advice and support to policymakers and to practitioners. As leaders, we recognise that we have a role to play in releasing the potential of others, enabling them to advance the cause of intergenerational work and relationships. And recognising and supporting the work of others lies at the heart of our session today, as we focus initially on the role and contributions of volunteers as learners, as leaders, and as innovators in our field. We'll shortly be hearing from our keynote speaker for the afternoon, Professor Matt Kaplan, who will be addressing us on that topic. But just before we hear from Professor Kaplan, I have to take a few minutes to map out the afternoon and cover off some practicalities. First, to say we'll be together in this webinar session between now and the break. And during that session, we'll, in addition to hearing from, from Professor Kaplan, be presenting the latest in our awards for excellence in intergenerational practice, and that's an award for the creative use of technologies. We'll then have a short comfort break and reconvene in three separate webinars, focusing on generating older active lives digitally, practice that transforms intergenerational programs, and ageism, intergenerational tension and solidarity, topics which I'm sure you'll get your teeth into later in the afternoon. Moving into those three separate webinars will involve us in jumping off this webinar and onto a separate link. And I'll say a bit more about that as we get closer to the break. Finally, before I formally introduce and hand over to Professor Kaplan, I want to remind you that there are a couple of ways in which you can get active and involved in the session. When we're in a webinar like this, we realize that people aren't able to talk to each other directly and contribute verbally, but you can get involved in other ways. You can use the chat function, uh, which some of you have already been in, introducing yourselves and saying where you come from, but you can use that to share information, to network with each other, to seek help from staff, to raise questions of colleagues, or just share thoughts that are stimulated by what you're hearing in the session. The second way that you can get involved is by using the question and answer function which you should see at the bottom of your screen, the Q&A icon. Now that's a function that's particular to webinars that doesn't appear in Zoom meetings. And it's our mechanism for enabling you to ask questions, particularly of Professor Kaplan, but also of the staff team or any of us involved in running the conference session. So please make use of that Q&A uh, function. We should have some time once we've heard from Professor Kaplan to pose some questions to him and the staff team will do that on your behalf. If you pop them in the Q&A box, we'll see them and pick them out and pass them on. Right, I think that's all the practicalities I want to deal with at this stage. There are one or two other things I will come back to later. So it's time now for me to formally welcome and introduce Professor Kaplan. Matt is based in the Department of Agricultural Economics, Sociology and Education at Penn State University in the USA. He is a prominent leader in intergenerational studies field, conducting research, developing curricular resources, 
and providing leadership and guidance in the development and evaluation of intergenerational programs in the US and internationally. He's published numerous works in the advancing the field, focusing on intergenerational programs and practices, particularly from an interdisciplinary and cross-cultural perspective. Professor Kaplan has a PhD in environmental psychology from the City University of New York Graduate Center. He was a visiting fellow at the Oxford Institute of Population Aging in 2015 and a senior Fulbright scholar from 1994 to 1995, studying intergenerational initiatives in Japan, lucky man. So I think you'll agree that Matt is very, very well placed to talk to us about matters intergenerational. So without any further delay, Matt, welcome to our conference. And we're all very much looking forward to hearing what you have to share with us over the next 25 minutes or so. Well, thank you very much, Graham. <clears throat> thank you, Alison. Thank you, Bella. Thank you, all the organizers and participants of this great conference. So happy to be here. Um, so might as well uh, dive right into it. It is snowing outside, by the way. Uh, it's nine o'clock in the morning here. Uh, so it's kind of strange. I hear it's windy in parts of Scotland for a change. Um, <laughs> excuse me. At any rate, uh, so let me just dive into it. Um, so this is my topic. Uh, volunteers as intergenerational learners, leaders, and innovators. And, and I realize that the main theme of the conference is uh, building an intergenerational nation. So I guess I could sort of subtitle this as um, not just building one community at a time, but one volunteer at a time. So it's going to really uh, take us into the micro, um, working with the uh, older adult volunteers that are involved uh, in our intergenerational work. Uh, so here's a quick uh, overview. Um, so I'll pretty much uh, just talk about um, a framework or perspective for uh, promoting intergenerational leadership. Um, so many of us uh, work with older adults in all sorts of roles. So I'll talk about the trajectory of how uh, we could support some, some such individuals going from lifelong learner uh, to senior volunteer to program leader and actually make a difference uh, in communities uh, that they live in and beyond. Um, then I'll talk about uh, this uh, multi, I guess, uh, uh, multi-platform system for work for recruiting and uh, connecting and energizing and amplifying the efforts of older adult volunteers. We call that the ILI, Intergenerational Leadership Institute. And I, I guess it could be framed as a self-directed leadership development kind of model. Give some examples and, uh, and talk about some of the impact that uh, having an ILI chapter could have uh, not only on communities, but on the organizations that anchor them and partner with them. So uh, it's basically a pathway. Uh, we'll talk about how do we support people who wanna do more than uh, focus on the volunteer management oriented kind of protocols of the organizations they're working with. Uh, so the emphasis is really, um, it's not only laying out the roles, but providing orientation and training to the intergenerational field in general, um, and then uh, providing many experiences and opportunities along the way. So um, I guess uh, what really sparked my uh, interest in really delving into this, uh, this way of working with older adult volunteers um, was my experience with Ed Krenzman, who was a volunteer in Hawaii uh, where I was at for nine years before I came to Penn State University about 21 years ago. Um, and uh, he was basically uh, the lead volunteer for this program in Wailai School in Oahu, uh, Hawaii. And uh, he, was, he was pretty remarkable. I mean, he was a really good volunteer, did a lot of work. Um, helped us, uh, he did a lot of role, he played a lot of roles in different classes, working with students, helping us set up uh, the room in a program we called Fellows, Fellowship and Lifelong Learning Opportunities at Wiley School. So he was really there, he's beloved and so forth. And then I got news that I was going, that I got the job at Penn State, I was gonna head out. 
I gave him a couple of months notice and uh, he was asking me for permission to do something. And uh, I was packing up, I had a two year old, you know, so many things to do. And I just said, you know, well, why, why are you asking me all these questions? Why don't you just do it? And I noticed, I think I noticed a twinkle in his eye. So he said, okay. So at that moment on, he, he became a leader and he started doing amazing things. And um, I could talk about that a bit, but um, I guess some years later, uh, he received the Generations United Outstanding Volunteer Award and uh, he was just really beloved. He spread the word around to different, uh, he spread the model around to different schools in Hawaii. Um, and even after he did pass away, even after he passed away, uh, to get a sense of uh, his impact in Hawaii um, and his role, his profound role and the legacy that he left uh, as apart from his uh, obituary in the, in, the, uh, in the local paper. Uh, it talks about, uh, about his influence on 400 children, not only at the school, but also that he took this program model kind of like a senior center within a school. So in a way it's a shared site model, took it to up to 30 schools around the island and uh, inspired and helped recruit 140 volunteers. And, uh, and his family members, I guess his uh, um, daughter uh, was quoted as saying that even after his illustrious career in the private sector, he, he counted this as the most profound, one of the most profound experiences of his life. Um, so so powerful, and, and I kind of realized in a humbling way that I was holding him back for those years of working with him. He had all this potential, and here I was feeling like we had a good volunteer management program. And uh, although he never complained, uh, he had all this potential, and he was kind of waiting for my leadership to drive things. So I started thinking, gee, you know, maybe... Uh, Lots of people who come in as, a, as volunteers have a lot more under their hood than, uh, than the potential we give them opportunity to express. Here's another example, this guy Saul Stiglitz. Uh, this is uh, from, my, uh, from my doctoral dissertation work in Long Island City, uh, New York, in Queens, New York. Uh, it was a community, intergenerational community visioning type of project. Here we are looking at a landscape uh, a land use map, finding out uh, in intergenerational groups, that's uh, Saul Stiglitz in the middle, uh, looking at where people live, how they live, how to make community life better. Um, and it was a six month program with six graders and a bunch of senior volunteers. And, uh, you know, looking back on it, he was, he was another amazing guy. Um, he really delved into the children's world, no matter what they shared in terms of danger, drugs, you know, violence and things they would rather not see in the community. He delved into it and connected them with citizen safety groups and, and uh, where they could report stuff and how they could feel safe, that he understood them. And for me, he just told me that, you know, I was onto something, I should continue this kind of work. And I, I think maybe that kind of encouraged me uh, in some subliminal way to keep going. So one individual really could make a big difference. So we, li we like to talk about great teachers as, as people who can spark learning, inspire people and so forth. Uh, I guess great leaders, um, and I forget where I get this quote from, but they multiply the intelligence in the room. And here's just a photo of a group of second graders with senior volunteer at a shared site facility in Pennsylvania, in Kane, Pennsylvania. And, you could just look at this photo. I mean, people do smile for photos, but there's something that kind of jumps off the page. This guy is totally accepted and it's almost like a family photo. I mean, the good kind of family where people want to be together. Okay, so just to keep going. Uh, and also I noticed along the way, there are different um, ideas about leadership, different uh, orientations. And I recognize that I really do have um, more of an emergent, uh, I guess, organic view of leadership. I believe that at some point uh, you, you uh, orient people to the, some possibilities and that give them space to develop 
interventions that you can help support, but that they would be really committed to doing. So I guess that philosophy would fit on the right side from that quote for, uh, from the author of The Little Prince, Antoine de saint Souvery. not that I speak French, but uh, it goes, uh, if you wanna build a ship, don't drum up people together to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. So that really struck me as, hey, I like that and that's sort of how I like to work. Um, and the total opposite is to be highly structured um, and basically lay out very clear roles. And uh, here's a quote uh, from someone I met uh, in Germany uh, at, a, at a large meeting on intergenerational work in a, in a region. Uh, he was the foundation head and he's basically wanting to uh, regimentalize um, what people do, how they do it, where they do it. In other words, uh, to um, basically engage in model programs uh, with fidelity, like, like don't have too much variation, get the model right and do it. So I guess it, what he said was we need, what we need is the McDonaldization of intergenerational work. Um, and to me, yeah, to my sensibilities, I, I noticed that the hair in the back of my neck kind of stood up. It just feels like, yeah. But in truth, truth be told, I think we want some of each, um, but I'm gonna be really talking more from the right side orientation. So here, I'll just talk about the ILI model for a bit. Um, basically, uh, so we have this framework that has three tiers to it. We call it a certificate training program and in intergenerational leadership uh, for older adult volunteers, although we've opened it up for uh, staff people uh, who work in organizations and agencies uh, and even volunteers, I mean, younger volunteers, people who are doing this work, want to do this work in different communities uh, to go through this three-tier program. Uh, it's, it begins with a short course on intergenerational programs and practices, uh, 16 hours. We usually do it in eight weeks, two hours a week, uh, a bunch of modules, and we have that. And that's followed by monthly application sessions. We now call them intergenerational think tanks because we've opened it up to local partners and researchers and students. Uh, and generally, it's to continue the learning of that short course. The short course, by the way, ends with, with the the participants, the older adult participants, um, sort of coalescing into their project groups, uh, work that they would like to do. They start towards the end of the course and continue to work on it after that and through these think tank sessions. So we have continued program planning, implementation and support. And uh, I guess the, progr the programs they choose really uh, are at the intersection between what's needed in the local community. Uh, also, the opportunities and priorities of the community to increase livability and so forth, but also the intersection with their skills and interests. So that really is uh, volunteer led. Um, and beyond that, we just continue to um, engage people as our colleagues uh, do, who are interested in uh, deepening their training and, uh, and leadership work. So we connect people as much as we can to local, national and international um, initiatives and training happening around the world. So we see the model as an incubator for creating and expanding intergenerational work, having an impact not only on the seniors, but the communities, um, and also um, on uh, maybe even society as a whole, if we get enough of these ILI clusters. Uh, so we call them ILI chapters. People like to focus on uh, the geographical sense of a community uh, in their work. So, um, and that's the first step setting for anyone interested in, uh, in setting up a cluster of this kind of work. <clears throat> we call it a chapter. We like to find like a lead uh, anchoring organization which provides space and support and a few partnering organizations uh, to, uh, to help recruit and, uh, and work and support the volunteers. Okay, so that's the only slide with that much uh, text on it, so. I promise, so it'll be mostly images from here on in. Okay, so um, I guess uh, the essence of working with ILI uh, participants is really uh, to, to have them drive their learning and action process according to their interests. 
And sometimes it starts with a lament. Um, for instance, I met a woman at a, an older, adult, older woman at a, a women's health conference. And uh, this is just when I was speaking on something else. We did not have an ILI chapter going there, nor did I have partners, nothing was happening. But I mentioned the model and she talked about how sad she felt <clears throat> that her and her husband um, could not carry on their, um, their skills and interest in promoting taxidermy. She said it's a lost art. And she says, uh, as far as she finds, her and her husband couldn't care less, uh, find that children couldn't care less about taxidermy. So basically she's saying all they care about is their computers, technology, gaming, um, and she basically threw up her arms and just felt that her heyday was in the past in terms of all the skill. And the I, we could not really set up an ILI around her, but again, she would be someone who would get so much out of this ILI kind of a model and that she would learn how to reach children and she finds schools and after school uh, programs to connect and think about how to maybe integrate some technology involvement to learn history, to explore and uh, engage in taxidermy type, uh, type of uh, activities. Okay, so um, some of the uh, other chapters, um, I'll just share with you some of the work from some of the chapters we've encountered. Um, in Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, Leah Bradley, uh, who's now with um, Empowering the Aging, the Ages, and also in Maryland. <laughs> um, this is Heyman uh, Interages Center. Uh, they were all it's just a couple of examples um, on the left. Uh, in terms of working with young children, there were a few of the ILI participants. They really wanted to do storytelling, story reading, and a discussion about family relationships. Uh, so they found uh, intergenerationally themed books for children. And they also use these books as a way to open up discussion about culture and similarities and differences between people. Um, another group is really into photography uh, and they, a high school group had a beautician training type of program. So they integrated uh, the interest in uh, the beauty of aging uh, with photography and they came up with some, a great program there. Um, uh, a program in North Carolina led by Paula Rafe uh, who's now um, leading a chapter in Madison, Wisconsin, an ILI chapter. Uh, they wanted to do something really big for Martin Luther King Day, which is a big deal here in the US. Um, and uh, they came up with a crafter noon for a cause. So they had a lot of people with, um, with experience with crafts, uh, especially fabric arts. So they developed interactive activities around learning about crafts of different cultures. Um, and different ages, and also to, uh, to donate, uh, to raise funds for some of the initiatives going on with their products. Um, a group in uh, British Columbia, uh, in Canada, Nelson, a small, small city, uh, as I understand it. Uh, they, some of the volunteers, I mean, some of the uh, ILI participants uh, realize there's a lot going on, which tends to be monogenerational, uh, but could and maybe should be intergenerational. So for instance, uh, Nelson uh, has a sister city relationship with a, a city in Japan, <clears throat> and it was mostly adults who were kind of driving that. Uh, so they, uh, they figured out a way to integrate um, a youth group that was also interested in international relations. Uh, so it became uh, so that all citizens across ages were, were engaged uh, in this uh, intercity uh, partnership and uh, with deep um, all sorts of uh, discussion about different cultures and, uh, and citizen global citizenship kinds of work. Uh, also the Nelson group had a group of seniors, uh, the ally group, a couple of seniors were involved in environmental uh, advocacy type of work. Um, and uh, they started thinking intergenerationally, and I guess they came across a college-based group that were also into activism and advocacy around climate and environmental uh, awareness issues. Um, and they got together uh, to organize a petition signing event and so forth um, and bond according to their shared interest in, in, in the environment. 
Uh, here's here's some images from our uh, chapter in State College, Pennsylvania, where I'm I'm based, um, and uh, you can see it's multimedia. We have some people, uh, you know, working with intergenerational writing experiences. Um, doing good with wood is the name of another project. So crafting, doing stuff like that, international relations through the Ten Thousand Villages organization. Connections uh, through different cultures and travel opportunities like the Ghana and so forth. Uh, Weaving Wisdom is a program that's really been taking off. Um, we don't say these are I ILI projects. Some of these we call it ILI inspired projects or supported projects. Um, and from these programs, we people got ambitious. They started. Uh, oh wait, they started um, planning, uh, planning like a retreat in the county. To turn, to turn on more administrators and staff onto this kind of work and to reach more volunteers. Uh, some really good uh, project ideas don't actually materialize, but I just show this one to show uh, how um, some of the ideas that come up would be ideas that I don't know any intergenerational specialists come up with them. I mean, when people are left to really uh, use their wherewithal to come up with ideas, here's a, one senior we had uh, we have still uh, was really involved in a beagle dogs rescue program and she was also passionate about trying to help children who have been abused or traumatized uh, at some point in their lives and she came up with this idea to connect these dogs with uh, these children and older adult volunteers and that these dogs who come into um, being orphaned in a way all, all had bad stories like being bullied <laughs> or being abandoned, you know, uh, the dog on the left, Molly, age eight, is very shy. So they had little pieces of paper with written notes introducing themselves, the dogs that is. So Molly, age eight, is very shy. She's very quiet. She was found in a, lot, in a landfill and she doesn't trust people. So here you have these dogs uh, and these children kind of connecting with the story and asking questions and the senior kind of getting you know, bonding with the children. So in terms of working with pe young people who have been traumatized, it's a very tough work, um, you know, to get people to open up and share, you know, I mean, you can't just ask them what's on their mind, why, why are they concerned, why are they anxious or very angry. So it's just a brilliant kind of intervention. And, and at some point we'll figure out how to do this model. There were some risk management issues. Like I guess they were afraid, uh, the youth organization was afraid the dog might snap at a child. But we'll get to it. So we've learned a lot of lessons along the road. Um, and uh, basically that the word leadership is kind of elusive. Some people don't like that word because it's too much pressure. So, <laughs> so um, that, it, that this kind of work is really a lifespan kind of work. There's no endpoint, just continuous. The think tank meetings that we have work really well. We get about 20 people now showing up. And uh, people are really sharing notes on what they're trying to do, and ideas for expanding or revising their work. Um, and it's really like a great community of, of people who are intermediate to advanced level uh, intergenerational specialists. So as far as the research part, we, we evaluate it. We, we look at, um, I guess, the, this continuum of one's intergenerational trajectory. Uh, so from our pre-ILI, questions to the post ILI questions, we try to um, ask them to self identify in terms of their level of engagement, like have you just where are you level one, which is more like hearing about a program that sounded cool uh, to um, learning more about it, joining it, uh, getting immersed in it, and then ultimately taking a leadership role in it. Um, and in terms of pre and post, um, we found in terms of how people talk about their abilities and inclinations to plan programs, um, there was probably the strongest impact. Uh, so at the beginning, they were saying, yeah, we're okay. We have like a moderate, I have a moderate level of skill in planning. And then we really got people to sort of feel like uh, more confident in their planning ability. In terms of program implementation, um, we had less of an impact. People were a little less confident in their ability to really implement, to have all the skills uh, and logistical abilities to implement programs. Again, we just did the post survey shortly after the short course. So I bet if we came back like five months later after these monthly think tank meetings, we'd have a different um, sense. 
So I want to just show a quick uh, video clip, three, four minute video on a on um, uh, one of the um, oops, one of the seniors, um, I guess, testimony on, on their view of leadership and what they got out of the program. So let me dive into it. Would you say if your aspirations are for your future with doing uh, intergenerational programs or Oh, projects? I would love to see this through. I would love to see this get established. I'd love to see it become something that could live on mm -hmm. uh, and be institutionalized someplace and, and have those components. And I, I just think the idea of uh, working through the university where you could have students who could do the three steps, mm -hmm. the individual stuff, you know, the local, you know, hands-on type mm -hmm. stuff that uh, we were talking about, and then the travel component to actually go and see other subcultures within the United States, and then that third component, and it, it, which is international. I, I just think that I would love to see something like that. We started with this one idea of fabric and how it speaks to us. Now it has branched off into a curriculum project for the public schools. It could possibly bring in older adults into the public schools to talk about their experience. And then there is even a component that would bring the generations together in a more meaningful way by possibly going to look at the culture of the Gullah people who were uh, a group of uh, people who were brought from uh, primarily West Africa and deposited in the, the southern, the islands off uh, the Carolinas where they stayed and for the most part were able to retain their own culture because they were on an island. So you have a, a beautiful place to see that transition between the traditional culture of Africa, then what was a result of the slave trade um, with uh, blacks from Africa being deposited in the islands, waiting to be transported to the mainland for slavery, but so many of them stayed and they were able to retain their culture and to be that transition between Africa and American culture. So wouldn't it be beautiful to have students and uh, older adults see this and to see the origin of it, to understand more about how people retain their culture, who they are, how do they communicate, and to do this through looking at something that we're all familiar with, that fabric, clothing that we wear. You know, we never really thought we were going to be doing real projects, mm -hmm. you know, that you were really going to implement. We thought, uh, you know, this is mostly on paper. But so uh, it's impressive that you, you know, actually can do it beyond the paper and pencil. Yeah. So, man, it just all happened to click, you know, with the, with the idea, and you know, we love the the acronym. And so we'll see. The yeah. ultimate goal is, yeah, that we get some, you know, national recognition, and and maybe even if it's maybe another one close by Meals and Wheels, like in another county or something, picks it up. Mm -hmm. So it would just branch out gradually. Yeah, it's been really good. I never thought, you know, when I signed up, you know, it's an eight week course, never thought in a year from mm -hmm. now, I'd be talking about it. So that's, it's like, wow, it goes past eight weeks mm -hmm. <laughs> into the lifelong thing. But yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it's been fun. Okay. Oops. So, uh, so there you have a sense of it, the power of it. Uh, many of the people who sign up for ILI, uh, I guess training and leadership support, uh, they have so much wherewithal 
and so much experience. So we're just trying to uh, help people express that in some cases, amplify their assets, their ability, their knowledge, and move forward with others uh, in groups and so forth to be doing projects. Um, I know I'm just about out of time. So in the next like two and a half minutes, I'd like, just like to mention that and I, it's not just the impact on, on uh, individuals and on communities, but also the organizations around it. So uh, in the work I do at Penn State, um, we have uh, an intergenerational program, like sort of an umbrella with many proms of different kinds of programs, different objectives. So we call that the Penn State Intergenerational Program. So working this ILI Institute um, chapter over the last like five or six years has really uh, pulled us in a direction that's really kind of cool. Our, our monthly meetings are now permanent. People look forward to them. Uh, people wanted to do uh, organize the state, I mean the county to do a retreat. Then Somebody said, let's do a conference statewide because we really seem to have it. We should be influencing others around the state. So we're working on a conference for July and we, we're gonna try to jumpstart uh, a statewide network. We love networks as do you folks <laughs> and, uh, and an intergenerational center. So that's what we're working on. This was the, the retreat at the county. And it was uh, looking at not only what's going on in the county, but what people feel are needed and what they want to work together on. So it was an action meeting, as well as learning about the work of the ILI participants. Um, and then people just said, hey, let's, let's get regular people and families more engaged. So we did like a friends fair um, to highlight the work of, of uh, groups that are doing intergenerational work to help them recruit participants. Um, and here are some photos from that fair. <clears throat> And then we do train the trainer uh, type workshops and share the model around at different meetings. Um, a meeting we had at State College with our Nittany Lion statue, which is world famous, we like to think. Um, and on the bottom right, I had a chance to, uh, to be in Scotland with our friends, some of whom I know that you all know. So here we see, um, of course, Allison. Um, and next to me, uh, we have uh, Claudia Acevedo, who does a lot of work, intergenerational work in Port. Portugal, uh, Charlotte with Impact Arts in Scotland, Vicky Titterington, linking generations in Northern Ireland, and of course our friend uh, Mariano Sanchez at University of Granada uh, in Spain. Uh, so we're working on the conference. We're continuing uh, to meet, and uh, it's really helping our helping us not turn this virtual center not really a full center because we don't really have staff with it, but now we're talking about a real center, integrating research, um, publications we're working on, partnerships with Generations United and so forth. The ILI is really energizing us because we have such motivated happening people around us. Uh, we don't look at them as volunteers, they're all colleagues. Occasionally when we get a grant, we actually pay people something for that time. Um, as far as publications on the left, those are books that we, uh, we've been involved with, with Mariano, Yako Hoffman, in South Africa, also with Oxford and uh, Lang Lang Thang, who you heard from a couple of days ago. Um, anyway, so let me stop here. Uh, here's my contact information. I'm happy to uh, to chat with anyone, share our resources. We try to put it all up on the website uh, website that we have um, without charging money, since us intergenerational people we have to stick together, right? So uh, thanks for uh, listening, and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing uh, having a discussion. Sorry, that was a little longer, uh, but uh, I think I got the message out. Okay, thanks, Matt. That was that was really interesting. I mean, I, just listening, I can see lots of connections to the, what we're trying to develop through generations working together. And I kind of noted down some phrases that kind of chime for me. But I love that notion of connecting, learning, and action, so that there's a, a, a kind of a progression from ra rather than a separation between them. And um, I've written down the phrase lament led action, which is an interesting phrase, but that thing about turning things which might start off as negatives or moans. We in Scotland are very good at moaning, but being able to turn moans into um, positive actions uh, is a really interesting thing to do. So thank you for all of that. We, we are beginning to become a wee bit pushed for time, but there's one question in the chat that I wanted to just pass on to you and see if you could give us a response to that, which was from Stephanie Green. And it's just a question about how ILI, 
ILI, which I, if I could say chapters, actually are embedded in organizations and made sustainable. How, how, how do they just become permanent? How do they get established and grow? Right, so as far as establishing them, generally it's one organization or agency that works with older adults, uh, volunteers, um, and uh, we encourage them to have like three lieutenant type uh, organizational partners uh, to help them set these things up, locate them, and everybody kind of um, connects and helps to train. Um, the, that's the embedded and getting started. The sustainability part, um, I've had to evolve my thinking on that. At first I thought we'd have like a, a hundred of these chapters around the world, uh, sort of take over the world with this model. But um, instead it looks like it's kind of, um, without funding, it's hard to uh, sustain this kind of model because the person who runs the course uh, would need some funds um, usually and who continues to facilitate the meetings and so forth. So some of them continue, some don't, they morph into different things and, and senior volunteers, they connect, they train. So they're sort of gorillas in the architecture of organizational change in their areas. And, and I'm okay with that. So, but at some point, I think we may want to uh, develop a structure and a network of ILI chapters, um, but that's not uh, the most important thing in my mind. It's to really um, provide these uh, local hubs of training and support an amplification of people's uh, um, intergenerational aspirations and abilities to get them started. So um, that's, uh, that's sort of where we're at. So we're not strong on the sustainability part, but we do have a model that seems to resonate and be consistent with the work many people are doing. That's great. Thank you very much. And I hope that answers your question, Stephanie. Matt, we're going to have to move on rather than get into conversation because I'm sure there would be more co uh, questions to come. Um, but we need to move on to a presentation of awards. So a, a formal thank you for that input and a reminder to everybody that Matt shared his contact details uh, and Kate has also shared in the chat some, a link that can take you to further information on ILIs. And I certainly think there is something in that model that we, we could be thinking about and working with in Scotland as within GWT and other places, we start to think about what our learning pathways might be for people who are involved in intergenerational uh, work. So at this point, it's time to kind of take a step to the side and focus on recognition of the excellent work which is already happening in Scotland. The Excellence Awards are things which we run every year and they're there to recognise innovation and outstanding intergenerational work around the country. They're about raising the profile of work. They're about sharing what works and good practice, practice and hopefully spreading that across the country. And over the years, we've adjusted our award categories to reflect the changing times that we're living in. Uh, and that's very much been the case this year and is reflected in the award that we're about to present, which is for the creative use of technologies. Uh, and I'm sure that we'd all agree that creative use of technology has just been become part of everybody's lives over the last couple of years for not the best of reasons, but lots of good things to come out of that. So. The award recognises that connecting generations and improving lives and relationships more and more involves technology. It recognises projects that have embraced diverse technologies and used them to creatively connect people of all ages together in mutually beneficial activities and intergenerational relationships. And that could be across sectors, communities, environments. We had a, a number of very strong nominations into this category and we have made a decision to have one project today which we would like to highly commend before we reach our eventual winner and our highly commended project is Welly Walker's Wednesday Sing Along um, which is about rekindling and singing through Covid. The Welly Walker's child minding and drum hive care homes had an established relationship where their respective participants came together to sing every Wednesday afternoon and that's a project that's been going on for a number of years and as we found ourselves in the midst of the pandemic that was something that couldn't happen in the way that it always happened and everybody was missing the interactions that they had with their friends from different generations. So the project quickly 
uh, embrace technology to try and keep that connection alive and sustain relationships and make sure that the singing could go on every Wednesday afternoon. And there were many hur hurdles to overcome in making that happen to do with where people could be in relation to each other, uh, the quality of Wi-Fi and all sorts of other things. But essentially what the project did was tackle each of those problems as they came along and find a solution to them, which might find them singing outside in the garden or in a creative caravan under a shelter in the rain or in the sunshine in a cabin and then in a cabin built uh, and having power and Wi-Fi installed so that it could be used even on winter's days. So Welly Walker's Wednesday Sing Along was sustained through the pandemic and made really good use of technology to keep a, a, a valued project and a valued set of relationships alive. So congratulations to Welly Walker's Wednesday Sing Along on being a highly commended project in this category. Which brings me to our winner in the Creative Use of Technologies category, which is Community Chorus Online. Uh, and we'll be hearing from Amanda Connell from Ratloch Community Campus in a moment or two about the project. But the central aim of the project is to reduce isolation and loneliness and increase connections between people. As the lockdown kicked in and carried on, the community chorus went online. They moved from singing face-to-face -face in a room to swinging on Zoom. The project managed to sustain an interest and keep relationships alive and bring a great deal of pleasure to all those who took part. It also had a secondary aim of building the confidence of older participants and using technology to connect, not just within the context of the choir, but more generally in their lives. So something that was good for their mental health and well-being, something that brought learning that in turn made another contribution to their mental health and well-being. So we're just going to hear now a short film which about the work of Community Chorus. Our community chorus that um, used to meet pre-pandemic and it was quite a thriving group and um, we work we have a great partnership with um, Big Noise Raplock who provide the musical expertise and the singing it, it would run in the lunchtime because we're really keen to make it an intergenerational group um, and we're very lucky to have a campus here where there's three schools um, and a nursery and so um, we can would run it in the lunchtime so that children could sing with local adults in the community. People really missed it when the pandemic came along and it, it was a big hole, certainly in my life, because I enjoyed taking part and others that we'd, you know, people that we'd keep in touch with. So it was from there that we decided it was time to try and tackle creating an online singing group. During the time when the, the whole country was locked down and kids were at home doing their schoolwork at home, the upside for us, or the upside for them, was that they could join Community Chorus, so technology can be used well, and this is a way that we're using it really well. I think the benefits of singing, just, they reach across all generations. People speak about how much they enjoy seeing, seeing the children that come and sing with us, and actually some of the kids pick things up so quickly, so it's like, right, you can stand near me because we'll, you know, we'll follow along. Obviously there's a lot of songs that maybe that older people would know that the children don't know. So we definitely learn, you know, from each other. I absolutely love taking part in it. I love all the people that sit here. It's good fun. And plus the fact the benefit is and you're in the house, right, nobody can actually hear your voice. You could pretend you're really good. You feel good after singing and it's good for your soul and spirit. We are doing a good thing so that other people will learn from us and the community is growing through that, hearing us 
online, even children participated online. We had one little boy, he was only three, and he was running around, and then occasionally he'd come up to the camera, see what was going on. So having that possibility for music, for kids to be immersed in it without knowing they're immersed in it, is, an, is another upside. When we first actually came together and you saw faces of people who maybe that was their first time ever on Zoom, it, it, was, it was really uplifting, really powerful. One of the good things is we've been left with this legacy of we don't all have to be in the same place at the same time. If there are more ways that we can bring people together, be it physically together, or as you saw, we involve people from the care home who are just down the road, but they can be together in the same room, albeit online. Overwhelmingly, the feedback is positive. So yeah, that just keeps, you know, helps us to keep going and keep growing what we're doing. You leave smiling, and I think children feel that, and, and adults too. So, Community Chorus Online, the winners of our Digital Creativity Award, and I should just say that it wasn't possible for some of the participants in the choir to take part in the making of that film because they were still uh, living with some COVID restrictions and regulations, and I'm talking there particularly about care home residents uh, and children from the primary school. Now, we're, we're delighted to have with us Amanda Connell, who's going to hopefully in a, a few moments say a few words uh, in acceptance of the award, but I believe that Alison, you have the award and you're going to wave it so that everybody can see it. This, this is the point where in a normal conference, you would, Amanda, you would come down onto the stage, there would be rapturous applause and uh, Alison or somebody would pass that award on to you. We can't do that today, but we promise it, it is on its way. And I just wonder if you'd like to say a few words at this point. Yeah, of course. We're so grateful to receive this award. Everybody's going to be so excited. Um, it, was really, it was really beneficial for everybody to go online. During the first part of the lockdown, everybody was really missing singing. So we were thinking about ways to bring it all together. We made some CDs and sent them out to people, but it just wasn't the same. So we thought we're going to have to get it online. So that was a wee mission in itself, getting people who've never, ever used technology, getting them set up with iPads and getting on Zoom. But it was, it's been fantastic and everybody really enjoyed it and benefited from it. That's great. Thank you very much and well done again. OK, we're now just about at the comfort break. We're actually 10 minutes beyond the scheduled time for the comfort break, but that's the way of these things. We'll just um, delay the start of the next session by a few minutes. Before we I, I run through a few practicalities uh, and send you off towards your individ individual webinars, I just want to say thanks again to Professor Kaplan for his input during that session. It's a shame we didn't have more time for conversation because I feel sure there was there were lots of things that would have started to emerge and hopefully people will find their own way to carry that conversation on further this afternoon. Um, just in terms of practicalities to get us from here to our next session, remember we have to log out of this webinar and into the webinar that you're planning to take part in between three and four. You should have been sent a, a link earlier in the day that will take you directly to where you need to go and all you need to do is click onto that and join in the normal Zoom way. If for any reason you haven't received that link, then just hang on uh, and for a moment or two and somebody will help you. Two or three other things really quickly before we go away to a break. A reminder, if you haven't seen this on our social media or in other ways, that uh, Global Intergenerational Week is coming up between the 25th of April and the 1st of May, and we want as many organisations, as many people as possible to take part in that. The week is growing year on year. There are more and more countries involved, and it would be great to see Scotland really well represented uh, and sharing the many fine things that are going on here and getting into interesting conversations with colleagues across the world. I have to do the kind of compulsory thing at conferences to say there will be an evaluation form comes winging your way and we really would be very grateful that when it does you take a few moments just to fill it in because it gives us feedback that helps us develop future events. Hopefully our next conference won't be in this format, it will be at least in part face to face and in a room perhaps with others joining us from a distance but evaluation and feedback really helps us to move those things forward. 
And my final practicality before sending you off is just to say that there is a conference page on the website and presentations from earlier in the week have already been uploaded. Uh, Matt's presentation will be uploaded later in the day so you can get access to those slides and that includes the contact information that you very kindly shared. Uh, and in a few days times, there will be days time, there will be a recording of, of each of the sessions so you can hear again or zone in on the bits you want to listen to a bit more closely. That's all on the website on the conference page. Thank you for your participation in the first hour. Enjoy a short break. Shall we say, Alison, everybody back by five past, ten past? Let's say five past. And uh, if that gives you time to go and grab a coffee or whatever, then you can carry that with you into your next webinar. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you.